Here to sit in this seat and help you blow up the world. All right, sir, you're up. H U G H. Okay. Okay. This is the Launch Control Center. This is the nerve center of the whole operation. And above us is the crew quarters you saw in the movie. The docents call it um, Motel One. The Marines would have called it the Hilton, but uh, that's neither here nor there. And down below us on the bottom floor are pumps, filters, uh, air conditioners, batteries, and also the entrance to the escape hatch that we showed you up above. Now, we are in the middle floor of a very unique three-story building. All three floors are made out of steel plate welded together, and the steel plates are fastened together using these x frames here. They're all around us. And we are underneath an igloo of concrete and... We're going to survive it, but we're not going to stop it. It's not going to bounce off of us. It's going to keep coming through. It's going to come through the walls, the ceiling, up through the technology that ran player pianos in the Old West. A century later was talking to nukes. So we would get a reel of this, put it on the reel, reel uh, machine here, run it. The computer or the missile would spit out a con uh, confirming strip, take it back to the base, get it read out, and make sure that everything had been done correctly. Now, this didn't happen very often. The missile, the warhead, the guide system came from the factory, were put into the silo, ready to go. Uh, one of my colleagues, block panel. You know, Chuck talked about the butterfly bivalve, the, uh, the security that they added to it by locking one of them up to prevent an inadvertent or accidental launch. <clears throat> so, you had to put in a combination to unlock it. There were 17 million different combinations. Six pinwheels, 16 characters each, only one of them worked, and it wasn't kept in here. It came in with the launch order. Okay. Here, this is the launch control monitor. When we turn those keys, and we start the process from dumb metal tube to terminator, this is what's going to control it. Now, we turn the keys, this panel's going to light up. <clears throat> and here, we have target selection and detonation type. We have three targets programmed into the missile. Obviously, we can only go to one of them. Okay. The default target for this system, for its entire alert life, was target two, which we can see right up here. If we had to change it to one or three, that would have come with a launch order. Simply push the button one or three to make that change. <laughs> and uh, we're down here on alert, 24 hours. We're about 20 hours into it. Um, it's hot, it's loud. Yes, sir? Target one, two, and three. The crew didn't know. We have no idea. That's right. So Thank you for mentioning that. We have no idea what they were. Hmm. We still don't. Bomber crews obviously knew what their targets were, but missile <laughs> crews did not. And why is that still not uh, it's still public not. information, even uh, though it's Because we probably still got them targeted. <laughs> oh. We've got Minuteman <laughs> missiles <laughs> up north. That, uh, I see. Yeah. Okay. And the Cold War is over, but it's not really over. <laughs> it's true. And uh, it's hot down here. It's loud. It doesn't smell too good. You know, people were smoking and we even got an ashtray up here. Right? <laughs> yes. you, know, you know, it's just that terrible. <laughs> and, uh, and then we hear this. That is the preamble to an emergency action message, which is our incoming order to launch our missiles. And the atomic pucker factor goes into effect immediately because <laughs> alpha 2, the first two characters, that is the uh, identifier for a real launch order. So, the voice says, message follows, the two officers have already gotten their notebooks, their emergency action notebooks out, and they copy the message that follows, 35 alphanumeric characters, one per line. The voice pauses, 
and goes, I say again, and then repeats the message. By that time, the officers have exchanged books, and they check what the other one wrote. And when they both agree that they have a complete and correct message, that is called a verified message, and that is their authorization to remove the locks from the EWO safe and get out the launch materials, which consists of launch keys, authenticator cards, and code books to decode the information that's in the launch order. Second thing we have to do is authenticate the order and make sure it came from the president and not from somebody who penetrated the system and sent out a fake launch order. So the second line here is called the authenticator line. And we look at the first two characters, and let's say they were an Echo Hotel. So we go through here until we find Stop. Echo Hotel. And crack it open. And we take out another plastic chip called a cookie. And we compare that top line with our second line here, and if they match exactly, this is the real thing. And we're going to send that missile out of here in about three minutes. So we're into the launch checklist now. Everything has a checklist here. Launch is no different. So we start decoding information. We get the launch time, and that's written across the clock right there. We get the butterfly valve unlock code. That is inputted here by the BNAP as the commander recites it to them. And we flip circuit breaker 103, which has never been turned on. That arms the explosive hold-down bolts that will release the missile from its thrust mount so we can leave the silo. Who does that? Who's, who's walking around actually doing that? Uh, probably the BMAT, the ballistic missile, but all four crew members would be in here. Okay. And once that's done, the last thing to do is to turn the keys, and that's we wait for our launch time, which we are going to assume is right now. So, Captain Hugh, uh, I'm going to have you uh, stand up. You're going to put your left hand on the key. Don't turn it in yet. Just watch my demonstration here, because we both have to turn the keys at the same time. Your thumb is going to be at, at about 3 o'clock. You're going to turn it down to about 6, and you're going to hold it until you get a green light here that says launch enabled. I'll give you a signal over. So he's going to watch for the light. Everybody else, watch this and watch the guidance system. And when they light up, we've got a live missile in the silo. Okay. On my mark. Three, two, one, turn and hold. Hold, 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 hold. All right, release. All right, have a seat. World War III is on autopilot. World War II lasted six years. World War III would have lasted about 90 minutes, and we're 20 minutes into it right now. The first thing that happens is electrolyte fluids start to fill the batteries in the missile for the first time. That takes 28 seconds, and at the end of that time, the missile's on its own power and it starts to cut us loose. Then the silo door starts to open. The ATS power means the batteries are full. Now the silo door starts to open. It's going to trip its own tipsy alarms on the way. And Water starts pouring into the bottom of the silo, which we'll talk about down there. We get silo soft, meaning we've got a big hole in the ground. The McGack talks to the missile one last time, sets the internal clock to zero because everything in inertial guidance runs out of time. Cuts it loose, audios to the missile, it's a terminator, engine ignition, fire alarms, and after two seconds, the hold down bolts pop. Four seconds later, that missile is in the air and on its way. It flies straight up for a quarter of a mile, and then it rolls and heads north over the polar ice region towards its target, presumably in the Soviet Union. And assuming everything works the way it's supposed to, 30 minutes and 6,000 miles from now, target two, whatever and wherever it is, will be vaporized. So total time from key turn to liftoff, 58 seconds. Total time from the first squawk to missile in the air, less than five minutes. Flight time, 30 to 35 minutes. Time remaining until Soviet warheads start impacting around here, about 10 minutes. So there are no orders for the crew after launch except to stand by. But if you consider the options, you get blown up in the attack, or you survive the attack and suffocate down here because you can't get out, or you work your way to the top and take your chances with the radiation. 
there were no good choices, and this was a one-way ticket. That's, that's the bottom line. But fortunately, it never came to that. So deterrence worked, did exactly what it was supposed to, and you know, guys like me and Ken get to come down here and you know, relive the glory days and talk smack about the Cold War. <laughs> yes, ma'am. In those years of the Cold War, how or if did the people in an equivalent place in the Soviet Union, what kind of back channeling was there so that they kind of knew this capability really clearly. Now, let me let me talk about that upstairs. Okay. Okay, when we get top side. Yes. Were all these silo um, locations identical, so you could switch yep. crews, or everything was the same? Everything was the same. Mm -hmm. What what altitude did they fly the, the missile? You know, I, I we will take your questions when we get top side. Yeah, uh, Ken, follow Ken down. Yeah, He's going to do the silo portion. Yeah. And uh, totally amazing. We have the beam of light being sent out here on a continuous basis, goes in through that panel, reflects back from a prism, back into the auto culminator, and if it's a guided system, then it's aligned to true north. There's actually a door here, so nobody's coming into this room, and there's an air conditioner that sits right here. Its sole purpose was to keep fog off the lens of that piece of equipment. So it's just using sunlight, I guess, from above? No, well...